Okay, so welcome everybody. And as uh, Angie mentioned, um, we are here today to learn about the foundations of building an investor ready pitch and presentation. Uh, that's inherently part of this as well. Um, and so it's my pleasure to be here and, and thank you very much to New Ventures for giving us the space and and uh, having us uh, be part of this. So it's it's our pleasure. Every year, we're so pleased to be part of this competition in some way as a, as a partner um, and or sponsor in this case. And um, it's just an incredible con competition. Great, or a great organization. Um, and so we're really proud to be here. So thank you very much. So a bit about me, just so you can know who I am and in case you don't know who I am. Um, so I am a 20 year entrepreneur uh, with about 15 years of pitching and fundraising experience. Uh, so extensively experienced in, in fundraising, pitching to investors, to, to everyone. And uh, all of that experience over the years has culminated in be, becoming a master pitch and presentation coach. Um, so daily, I generally am working with entrepreneurs and, uh, well, with entrepreneurs and startups on their pitches and presentations, and also working with investors on the investor side as well uh, in terms of looking at companies too. So we have a pretty extensive network on both sides. And as Angie mentioned, I am one of the co-founders and managing partner of uh, Volition. And so a bit about Volition. So at Volition, we, believe, we build capacity, connectivity, and uh, opportunities for knowledge sharing in the global startup ecosystem. So part of what we're doing with New Ventures is, is uh, part of what we do. A lot of what we do is programming, design, development, and delivery uh, with programming partners like New Ventures, um, but also other organizations like CAST in the Kootenays, Hubspace in Prince George, uh, organizations in Alberta, Ontario, uh, soon to be Quebec. We've launched in uh, Albania. We just recently launched in Kenya, uh, Ghana, um, as well as we're working on programs for organizations in Greece and really kind of all over the world. We're launching uh, later this year outside of the UK. I mean, outside of London, I meant to say. Uh, and many more places. In addition, and as Angie alluded to, we also run uh, events. Um, generally, those look like pitch events. Uh, and as you can see at the statistics at the bottom, we've done more than 100 events uh, in the last five years. And so as a result, not only do I work with companies on their pitches, but we see and have seen a lot of pitches and presentations um, and provide a lot of feedback and guidance in that regard. And, and then Alluding again to what Angie was talking about before. So I'm one of uh, currently 12 coach advisory coaches on the team. We're actually just about to bring on four, uh, maybe even five more. Um, they're just being onboarded right now, which is really cool. One of them is in Kazakhstan, which is really, really cool. So uh, really excited to see our growth and get to help entrepreneurs all over the world. And hopefully that's you as well. So talking a little bit about and, and setting expectations for what we're going to see and hear today is we're going to go over some things. Uh, number one, we're going to go over a bit about the pitch mindset. Uh, we're going to talk about memorability and, and to more of that effect of, of how to be memorable um, and why that's important. You can probably make some assumptions, but we'll go through that anyway. Um, we're going to talk about uh, Volition's unique pitch building technique, which is called the Pasoyas methodology. And then we'll also talk about some flags, red flags, green flags for investors particularly. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this out loud, but the reality is if you're in the competition, um, then realistically the judges are, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, maybe Angie's going to put me on mute, but um, you know, the, I, don't, I don't think it's a secret that a lot of the judges are probably investors. And so a large part of what they're going to be looking for is investability, growth plans, uh, team, uh, pedigree, that kind of stuff. So um, we're going to talk a bit about that. You're not wrong, Paul, but I will just add that um, you don't have to be raising money to win the competition. Though. Totally. Absolutely. And I will, I actually, you know what, I'm going to talk about that for a second. So when I refer to investors, that's a great point, Angie. Thank you very much. Um, great plug and, and, and uh, um, timing there. So I do want to say when we're talking about investors, if I mention that throughout the, the presentation, I don't look at investors as just for money. Actually, that's kind of the secret in a sense, right? So I don't necessarily look at them just for money. It's actually about building connections and relationships. And for me, investors is more about 
anyone who's willing to invest time, money, or knowledge, or even connections, right? Because all of those have value. And then from my view, investors even can be like potential early team members who are willing to take the risk on joining a, a startup if there is a risk there. Um, it could be partners, early customers. Um, investors can look different in different ways depending on what they're they're providing or doing. So yeah, there's of course the conventional investor of like putting in a check, but I always kind of look at it as they're more than just a check. Uh, and that's just kind of my uh, view on investors. So to be very clear in that in that sense. So first and foremost, I want to talk about the pitch mindset. So what I have seen quite often over the past 15 years, and of course, we see this on shows like Dragon's Den and Shark Tank. And, you know, I've even been to events, uh, you know, what they would call investor level events even, is, you know, people walking in with the idea that I'm here number one, as Angie was alluding to, to raise funds. Um, and, and ultimately, what does that mean? You know, I've, I've seen many times where people are walking into the room expecting that they're going to get a check on the spot. I'm sorry to tell you this, but it generally does not work that way. I have seen, as you can probably well imagine, in these 15 years, I've seen a lot of pitches and I've been to a lot of events. And if I was to gauge let's just take a guesstimate. I've probably seen 3000 pitches. I'm going to say I've probably been to two, 250 events. And in all my time, I've seen one check written on the spot ever. So the reality is, is we have to remember that Dragon's Den, Shark Tank, that kind of stuff, it's made for TV. It's entertainment. That's not real life. And so we have to try to remember that getting out of the frame of mind that this is a transaction. It's about walking in and just getting that check and it's a transaction. And, and this is sort of alluding to what I was just saying before, which is, you know, looking at investors or even in terms of having your pitch, not necessarily just be about getting a check or, or that instant transaction. It's really about the opportunity to get in front of people, to um, do things like practice your messaging, to build amazing connections that could be in insanely valuable in the future. Some of the connections I've made at pitch events have ended up being actually more valuable than even a $10,000 check that I get from an investor, quite honestly. Because you know some of those conversations, I always have a saying of you never know what can come from a conversation. Some of those conversations have resulted in people becoming partners, customers, uh, customers who've paid me far more than a $10,000 check. Um, so you never know. Um, you never know what can come from a conversation. So the pitch is really an opportunity to get out there, spread your message and, and build awareness uh, and really build uh, connections, um, not only for yourself, build trust. I'm going to go back into that in a second, but I wanted to give you some examples, uh, even from the pictures that are on the screen right now. So on the very top, if some of you may know her, her name is Anna. She is uh, with a company called My Momentum, um, the CEO of uh, My Momentum founder. So Anna is a, an amazing pitch alumni of ours and um, incredible smile, really charismatic, but is also an incredible pitcher. And you know what? She comes out, she doesn't come out to, to pitch to get money. She's coming out to build connections, to gain trust, and build awareness about my momentum, which I highly recommend to everybody. It's a really cool wellness app uh, that you can download that basically rewards you for living well. It's really cool because you can turn in the points for um, like food and snacks and drinks, uh, all wellness uh, related items. Um, and so it was really about coming out and building that awareness and, and also testing her messaging, testing uh, how people felt and getting feedback on the business itself, how people felt about it. What, what would they want if they were to have an app like this? Um, and really building up that trust factor and ultimately valuable connections. And as a result, even coming out to the pitch events, she met, I believe it's two of her employees at our pitch events. And that's not me trying to brag about our pitch events. That could be at any event, realistically. I'm just saying the point of getting out there building that trust, being up on stage. I say on stage, I know right now we're all virtual, but you know, getting out there, 
putting yourself out there and building those connections. A lot of that is about building that trust and people being like, wow, I really want to do business with this person, right? It always kind of makes me think of that Simon Sinek, uh, start with why, right? People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And so when people are up there, when you're up there pitching and you're, you're pitching with that passion, you know, you're showing off what you're doing, you're kind of showing off your baby in a sense, right? And, you know, now people also want to be part of that. Um, and that's what it's really about is getting out there. Another example uh, is Kara from uh, in the middle from the CEO and founder of Bucha Brew, Canada's one of Canada's most um, popular kombucha brands. You know, getting out there, she came in to pitch, not necessarily to raise money. She was opening a round. She had a bunch of um, uh, purchase orders from stores and needed to eventually raise a round to fill those orders. But she really just wanted to get out, build connections and knew, you know what, if I'm going to get out there and I am going to raise money and I'm going to get the money to fulfill these orders and my product is going to be on store shelves, I got to tell as many people as possible so they go and buy the product. And she was awesome. She brought with her to, to the pitch a whole bunch of uh, product. So she got people to actually try it. It was really, really cool. And last but not least is uh, at the bottom there is Andre from Robox Tools. Now, when I say a drill, I know a lot of people don't get too excited about a drill or, or power tools in general. I guess there's some people out there that get super excited about it. I'm not necessarily one of those. I'm good with computers, not with building stuff. I'm first step is admitting it. But the with Rawbox, it's actually really cool because it's the world's first smart drill. And when they started coming out, I remember the first time they came out, they came in with a chunk of metal with an iPod taped to it. And they were like, this is going to be what it looks like. And it was like, really? And now they've actually built it at a working X drill. You can find it on Kickstarter. It's really cool. But they weren't coming out again, necessarily about raising funds, it was coming out to improve their messaging, make connections, build trust and talk about their upcoming Kickstarter campaign, right? And so when they were launching, then they already had broken down those barriers of trust and, and made those uh, interesting connections. And in fact, I again, also met one of their engineers at one of our pitch events. So, you know, the pitch is more than to Angie's point, in this, in this sense, alluding to that, is that the pitch is more of an opportunity than just raising funds. That, that isn't what it's about. It's a build, about building those valuable connections and ultimately starting conversations because you never know what can come from a conversation. So ultimately, part of your purpose, really, when you're getting out to pitch, as far as I'm concerned, from my perspective, it's about generating intrigue and trust, right? So getting out there, showing who you are, you know, people connect with people. And when they get to see you, you know, like I said, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. When they're seeing your passion and, and getting a sense of who you are and building that trust, it's really about uh, generating that intrigue, you know, oh, wow, I really want to learn more. I want to potentially work with this person. I want to uh, help this person, right? Because let's be realistic. I know this. Building a company, having a startup, it takes a village. You, it's almost impossible to do on your own. So you've got to build connections. You've got to build a village, people that can come out and help you out. And the nice thing about events like these, pitch events, whether it's our events or new ventures events or whatever, you know, the nice thing is it's usually filled with a whole bunch of people that want to help you. They want to help each other. That's the type of community we are in. And, and um, it's amazing to see. So you got to get out there and build that. In addition, like I said, you can't walk in and expect like, okay, I'm going to pitch and I'm just going to have, you know, checks thrown at me. They're going to, you know, one of those uh, money guns where they're just starting to shoot the money at you. It, it doesn't work that way. What you're really aiming for is securing that second conversation. Normally, if we are talking about an investor, the, the normal uh, process is that you will pitch and they'll go, okay, wow, this is interesting. And you know, I, it, you'll make a connection and then you know, pre or post pandemic times is then you, and even now, I guess you do a virtual coffee or pre or post, you'll, you'll do a coffee, you'll have a conversation. They might wanna go further. Maybe you have a lunch kind of idea, you, you talk further and there's further conversation because they're going to want to learn more. They're going to want to dig further. 
and then make a decision from there. And then ultimately, again, your pitch is really about increasing visibility. So really getting people to see things like your brand, uh, getting to know who you are, getting out there. And like I said, building even community around yourself and connections that can be uh, incredibly valuable uh, over time as you, as you build your business. So now that brings me to memorability. Um, so memorability as part of the pitch, this is extremely important. So, you know, let's talk about a pitch competition like New Ventures or many others. I've been to pitch competitions where there's 15, 16, 17, 18 companies pitching. And I'll be honest, by the time it's done, whether I'm a judge or I'm in the audience, by the time it's done, you get this sort of like mind melt and all the companies start kind of like melding together. It's hard to remember all the details of all of them. Depends how well you take your notes. But sometimes, you know, you get these companies that will come out. I've seen pitches where they come out and they just, you know, it's called steamrolling. They just come out with a whole bunch of numbers. Oh, it's a huge market. We're going to make millions of dollars. It's, and you know, the market is 10 million. We're going to make 20 million. We're going to do this. And it's all just numbers, numbers, numbers. Problem is that's not really memorable, right? Um, so let's get into how we can be more memorable. So what I've found over the years, not only for myself, but in studying even some of the most successful pitches over the years, whether this be on TV or in person at pitch events, over and over again, what we see is that the pitches that perform the best are the ones with the best story infused into it. Now, there's kind of two ways to kind of go about this. This might be with, uh, you know, a story within a pitch. So it might have a, a story within there that's sort of a compelling strategic hook. And this might sound like, you know, the, the average entrepreneurial story that I always like to think of is like, you know, I was doing a thing, a thing happened. I talked to some people, they had the same problem. So I built a solution to the thing. Now I'm looking for money or connections to make the thing a reality or to grow the thing, right? Um, you know, this is the average entrepreneurial story and you could kind of interlay whatever you wanted into there, but that's generally what it sounds like, right? Or I was doing something and then I was like, oh, there's got to be a better way to do that. So then I created a solution or a, a better way. So, you know, having that strategic hook in there to, to really connect with people and bring them in. And then there's the narrative pitch style where the whole thing sounds like a story. And let me, let me relate it to you like this, is I usually ask people, I, I mean, I can't see everybody, but you know, usually what I'll do is if I was in a classroom, I would normally just ask people and I would say, well, let me ask you who here has that uncle or aunt or grandfather, grandmother, maybe mom or dad, that's the great storyteller. And do you ever remember a moment in time where it's like they start telling a story and everybody crowds around? It's like, you know, you got a crowd around the campfire or the kitchen table or whatever, right? We all, I would say that almost all of us have that kind of memory of having somebody in our family or, or our uh, friends that's an amazing storyteller. And you're just, you're drawn into what they say. And part of the reason that they're successful at it, some people are really natural at it. But part of the reason for that is it's almost like you feel like you were there, right? You feel like you were part of it. They make you part of it almost even, right? And that's, that's, a, that's a methodology of great storytelling. Now, here's the thing. I know some of you in the room might be like, well, but I'm not a, I'm not a storyteller, Paul. Like, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. But here's the difference. How many of you are robots? I'm gonna guess that zero people will pull up, pull up their hand. Nicely, the, uh, we're luckily, we're, none of us are robots yet. Uh, we haven't got to that point. So here's what I would actually say to you is it's actually a lot less natural for humans to be scripted. Scripting and memorizing a script is actually very difficult, especially in the case, Angie can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe NVBC is a 10 minute pitch, I think, or somewhere on uh, there. It's, uh, I think it's 10 to 15. In this 10 round. to 15, yeah. okay, good point. 
right? So imagine having to memorize a 10 to 15 minute script. Oh my gosh. I'm good at pitching. I have a lot of practice, but I'll tell you what I'm not good at. I'm not good at memorizing scripts. I'm not, but I'll tell you what I am good at is, well, at least I think I'm good at storytelling. And you might say to yourself, well, but maybe I'm not, Paul. Here's the thing, you are. We all are. It's actually very natural for us. When we were kids, we did it all the time. We created stories, we played with toys, we were imaginative, we made up stories. We actually are na more naturally good storytellers than we are at memorizing scripts. Now, I know there's probably somebody in the room that right now is, I always have one, that one person's like, no, no, you're wrong, Paul. I'm really good at it. I'm good at memorizing scripts. Well, congratulations. That's awesome. But you're like one out of usually 100 or one out of 50, right? So it's more, generally speaking, people are, are naturally good at storytelling. It's just one of those things you sort of have to bring forward. And here, I'll, 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 give, you, I'll give you help bringing that forward. So, you know, I always think of, you know, what are the basics of a conversation? Uh, one of the things that people ask me sometimes is uh, they say to me, especially when we had live events in person um, from people who are just starting out. I'll give an example of uh, maybe a student who's just starting out and they're like, I want to network. How do I network, Paul? I'm shy. I'm scared to have a conversation. I don't know what to say. And what I would tell them is, well, let's just think of the basics of a conversation. I'm Bianca is the first person on my screen. So I'm going to pick on Bianca for a second. So if I was, uh, I don't know Bianca at an event, but I, if I saw her, she looks friendly. So I walk up and I say, hi, who are you? Oh, I'm Bianca. And what do you do? Well, I'm building a cool company. It does cool things and I'm pretty awesome. Great. Uh, why do you do it? Oh, well, because I really care about the manatees and the planet and uh, plastic sucks. Oh, okay, cool. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, where do you do that? Oh, I do it in Vancouver. That's where we started. We're planning on going internationally, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, when did you start? Oh, well, it's, we started a couple of years ago um, and now we're, we just launched you know, our prototype this last few months. Um, and then I'll usually say, end off with saying, how can I help? If you notice, the basics of a conversation really are just who, what, where, why, when, how. And just to give you a bit of background on this as I head into the next slide, where this kind of came from was years ago, when I uh, started pitching how it started, was actually I was in my first tech company. It was a social gaming company. And I was sitting at my desk. It was me and one other person. And the owner came in and uh, he goes, uh, hey, I know some high net worth people and you're going to go start pitching. And I was like, what? I'm going to do what now? I've never done that. How do I build a pitch? What do I do? And I'll be honest, 15, 14, 15 years ago, I, I did my research. I went onto YouTube. I was Googling was trying to find resources, but I really couldn't find much. Now, one of the advantages I had was I was a songwriter uh, in a past lifetime. That's another story for another day. But I thought to myself, okay, well, if I think one of the business principles that my uncle taught me when I first started, uh, when I was 19 to 21, was, you know, when in doubt, keep it simple. Keep it stupid simple, right? I think we've probably all heard that. And I said, so what's what's a simple way that I could approach this? If I keep it simple, what could I do? And that's where I started thinking to myself, okay, well, if I was writing a story, how could I keep it simple? And I know that, you know, when uh, writers are writing a script for a movie or a TV show, a lot of times what they'll start out with even is who, what, where, why, when, how, right? Who are the characters? What do they do? Where do they do it, right? Like you could even intersperse that with friends. Everybody knows friends, right? Who are they? Well, there's Joey, Monica, right? Et cetera, Rachel. Uh, what do they do? Well, Joey's a struggling actor, right? You can start filling in the blanks. Well, here's what I'm gonna tell you guys. You all know your own stories. Guaranteed you know your story, right? Bianca knows who she is. She knows what she does. Uh, I'm gonna hopefully pronounce her name right. Yolanda? Yes. Uh, Jolanda knows who she is and what she does. She knows her story, right? 
We all know our story. That's the easy part to start with. There you go. You're already part way down uh, the, the, the track. So how do you get down the rest of the track now? So as I kept researching and thinking about it and thinking about like, okay, well, hold on. If a pitch, if I think of a pitch, like a story, you know, I, what I do know is in my case, I'm a good storyteller. I used to write songs. You know, if, if I think of it as the kind of the same thing, then how do I, how do I build that? And it reminded me, I'm going to bring you guys all back to high school, maybe even elementary school for a second. You probably remember this. And this is the conventional story arc. I know you didn't come here to learn and come back to elementary and high school. I know that's not what you came here for, but I just want to give you some parameters of where this all came from and how, how simple it actually is to build a story rather than script. And so if we look at this and we think about this for a second, why does this narrative story arc exist? Why has it existed for hundreds of years? It's still being used today in the movies we watch, the books we read, the TV shows we watch, right? The reason is, is because psychologically, our brains expect this information in this order, right? Let me put it this way. You watch a TV show, and if they don't introduce the, the characters properly, they don't introduce the characters' challenges or what's kind of their deal, what ultimately happens? Most of us will go, well, even in the battle, if one of those characters dies, I don't care. Doesn't matter. I'm not connected to the character. Doesn't matter to me. There was a show I was just watching the other day. I'm trying to remember what it was. Um, but they didn't do any character development. And by the time the big climax happened and a bunch of the characters died or got hurt or whatever happened, I was just like, I don't care. Oh, it was a show called Clarice. Uh, it's based on like the Sons of the Lambs. Uh, it's like a uh, sequel, I guess, in a sense, a TV series. And just been watching it for a while and then people are getting affected. And I was just like, I don't care. Um, and I think a part of the problem was that it didn't really develop the characters very well. They just assumed that everybody had watched The Silence of the Lambs and they already liked Clarice, right? But if you're kind of new coming into it, it's sort of like, yeah, I don't really care, right? So now here's the part of storytelling is that's where the introduction comes in. You need to introduce the characters. Well, who is that? Who's the character in this? It's you, you're the character, right? Even to an extent, your customer is your character. So I'll come back to that in a second. So then you've got your rising action. Well, again, psychologically, this is how our brains expect the information. If you're gonna tell me about characters, you're gonna introduce characters to, to me, I wanna know what's gonna to happen to them. What's the big, you know, what's the thing that's gonna to happen to them? What's their challenge? Because otherwise, what am I even watching this for? What am I reading this book about? Then it gets to the big climax, the, the battle scene or whatever that might be. And then of course, I don't have it here, the falling action. So kind of like, what's the fallout? And then eventually the resolution. Now, funny enough, what happens if you, you know, I know it's been a while since we've all walked into a movie theater, but if we can remember back to, uh, you know, two years and 20 years ago, um, you know, if we can remember that far back, um, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I know there was times where I, sometimes I would walk into the theater and go, I didn't really get that movie didn't really make sense. It was jumpy, jumped all around, all over the place. It didn't really make sense. Or maybe there's a TV show you watched, the same thing, or a book that was like, yeah, I didn't really get it. It kind of was jumping all over the place. It's a lot of times it's because they didn't follow the conventional story arc. So your, your brain actually, this is no offense to you guys. This is just the human brain. It's how it works. You just couldn't really follow it. It, it, it wasn't done in a, in a natural way. So that's where it brought me to thinking, well, hold on, maybe a pitch is sort of the same thing. So if we start out by introducing the, the problem, and then here's the funny thing, what I've tested this many, many times, if I'm in a classroom, for example, and I say, okay, everybody, here's a problem. 98 to 99% of the time when I say, what do you wanna hear next? Most people say the solution. What's the solution to the problem? Okay, great. So here's the problem. 
And so from that problem, I started building a solution. That's the rising action. Now, if we imagine for a second, from an audience perspective, audience could be investors or whoever it is, but they're listening to this. What's the climax for them? It's the opportunity. Opportunity is made up of things like who's in the team? How do you make money? How do you grow? How do you stay sustainable? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'll come back to that in a little bit. And then, of course, uh, out of that, what happens next? So I, I don't have it here, but the falling action would maybe be the plan of how you're going to grow from there. What are you going to do next? And then ultimately, the resolution being the ask. So cool story, or I guess as the meme says, cool story, bro. At the end, the ask is the resolution. What do you need? What's the most important thing that you need to make this go forward? What do you need to help this propel or progress or you know, get to the next step? So it's a great way of forming a, a, um, a story. And so here's the funny thing. Again, as I show this to you, there's nothing necessarily that needs to be scripted about this. I would bet you for any of you in this room that are building a startup, that are building a company, I bet you if I asked you this information, you know it. You know it off by heart. Absolutely you do. If I said, what's the problem you're solving? Well, the problem I'm solving is this. Great. And what's the opportunity? How do you make money? Well, I make money by doing this et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I say to you, well, what's the thing you need most to help you? You know that too. It's not necessarily about scripting it. It's about telling the story. But telling stories is more yes. about, I've got feedback suddenly there. Oh, uh, so telling stories is more about having a structure to follow. Once you understand the structure, you just need to know where you are in that structure. That's it. So that led me to create and us to create uh, something that I'll show you in a second uh, called the Pasoyas methodology. Now, the advantages are, as I said, is that being able to follow this structure gives you the ability to follow a flow. And when you have that flow, it means you can be less scripted. What are the advantages of that? The advantages are when you're less scripted, instead of being Hello, my name is Paul. I have a company. It is doing cool things. We can make the money. The money is good. You want to invest in my company because we have our uh, money. Not very exciting, right? And if you heard that amongst 10, 15, however many pitches, sorry to say, probably going to be forgot forgotten about, right? Because it's not, there's nothing to it. Whereas if you get up there, you're less scripted, but you're telling a story, they're going to remember you. You're going to have time to build trust and maybe, depending on what it is, empathy with the audience, depending on what the problem is you're solving. They get to learn about who you are. And let me tell you a little secret. In case you guys didn't know this already, the reality is for most investors, especially at early stages, they're not necessarily always investing in the business itself. They're really investing in the people. I saw Miriam. Thank you, Miriam. I saw you mouth it. Awesome. Two points for you. Totally, right? They're investing in the people because here's the reality. Why is that? Because the reality is, as you're building your startup, you're probably going to end up pivoting five. I think the average is usually five to seven times in your, in your uh, startup cycle before you really get product market fit. And not to be negative, Nancy, but like if you can make it that far. And along the way, really as an investor, I need to believe that you're gonna make the good decisions and that you're gonna be able to make decisions and ask for help and be coachable and figure out that journey. Because I know a lot of people from the outside looking in are going, oh, it's just a straight line. It's easy, it's super easy, barely an inconvenience. But what we all know, what we know as a collective is it's actually more like this, right? The, the roller coaster ride ups and downs, right? And so as an investor, it's more about me trusting that you're the right person and the right people to be able to navigate that journey. And, and the, you'll figure out the business, right? I have an investor that invested in me years ago and 
he invested in the company. He was like, to be clear, I don't have any interest in this type of technology. And I was like, then why did you invest? And he was like, because at the end of the day, I just believed in the team and that you would figure it out. That's what I'm investing in. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. And that's not just that one investor. I've canvassed many others. And many of them have the same sentiment, especially at early stages, because there's such a long journey ahead of you, right? Um, there's a lot to figure out and do. We all know that. Now, in addition to having this, this narrative, this flow, the cool thing is also you get to maintain people's attention, right? It's hard enough to do that <laughs> in any regular environment, um, just because humans get distracted easily. But the reality is, is when you're telling a story, remember what I told you about the grandfather, grandmother, you know, everybody crowding in, like if you can tell a great story and guess what, once you start practicing it, which is kind of the purpose of pitching in a lot of cases, once you start practicing it, you're going to get better and better and better. And people are going to get more and more intrinsically interested into what you're doing because you're going to get, become really good at telling your story. And your story is going to evolve as your business evolves. Your story is going to evolve as you evolve. This is the great thing about it, right? Again, you're not scripting, you're storytelling. And then last but not least, you also have the advantage of when you're telling a story in a structured way, you can make sure that you are ticking all the boxes. Now, what I mean by that is, is that for any audience, especially investors, uh, many investors I know actually literally use this saying, which is, I'm looking to tick my boxes. I'm looking for them to tick the boxes. And preferably that can be in their mind. I've even seen investors have things written down where they're checking things off as they're listening. Um, I even, uh, Angie and I know another investor named Thalzell. Uh, she uses a similar terminology, but she says, fill the buckets. Fill my, I'm looking for an entrepreneur to fill my buckets, right? Same exact thing. What we have to remember what is the, what's behind that is investing in of itself is inherently risky. There's no doubt about it. And so what are we actually looking for when we're looking for investment opportunities is we're looking for people to, to de-risk, okay? Most investors actually walk into a room already having decided not to invest. Now it's our job to convince them otherwise. How do we do that? We de-risk by ticking the boxes. And more boxes we tick, the more we de-risk. That's ultimately what we're aiming for. Now, having a good structured narrative story allows us to tick those boxes and do our best at de-risking the opportunity. So they want to further the conversation. That's our job and what we're trying to do. So as I mentioned, all of this narrative storytelling, structuring, all of this brought us to creating what we call the Pasoyas pitch methodology. And so it looks like this. And it's quite simply start with the problem, goes into the story, uh, sorry, start with the problem, goes into the solution, then into the opportunity, which includes you. We can't forget that. And I'm going to stress that because we've seen a lot of pitches and I cannot tell you how often people forget to include themselves and or their team. It's incredible. And I know many of you might be like, really? It seems so obvious. It's incredible how many times we see it. So I, it bears mentioning it. So um, the opportunity includes you, of course, things like how do you make money, all that kind of stuff, but I'll do, I'll go more into that in a second. And then ultimately your ask, uh, what do you need to make this all happen? So I'll go into the, all these sections a little bit deeper in just a section, uh, a second. And so, you know, some of the ways we can do this is of course, we can form this all into a story. Um, it's all surrounded, created into a story or we start with a story that leads into it. Um, you know, one of the best pitches I've ever heard was from a company called Blaze Biosciences out of Seattle. I believe the CEO's name was Rebecca, if I remember right. And it was amazing because how she started it out, she walked into the room. And if I pretend I'm her for a second, you know, she walks in and she says, uh, hello, my name is Rebecca from Blaze Biosciences. Now from the name, you can't tell what they do. There's something having to do with bioscience. Who knows? She says, two years ago, my father passed away from a brain tumor. Pause. But it wasn't the brain tumor that he passed away from. It was for the following invasive 
surgeries because they didn't get it all the first time. So as an entrepreneur for 20 years in the life science sector, I felt like there had to be a better way. So what we've done at Blaze Biosciences is created a novel solution using a solution process using a form of scorpion venom and a chemical solution that when injected into the brain highlights the affected area up to 99.98%. Uh, so that it can be removed mostly if not all the first time, reducing the, the um, downside to the American healthcare system by up to $200 million. She talked about her team, they're all extremely experienced. And then we're in our th phase three of clinical trials. We're looking to raise X, which is gonna be matched by the Bill Gates Foundation. Join us today so that your parents don't have to go through the same challenges. I still remember it today. And that was four years ago, I heard that pitch. And guess what? The one I mentioned that got the check on the spot, that's the one. So again, memorable, right? She told the story, but she also legitimized the entire thing as she was telling it. And it wasn't, yeah, it was scripted, but it was not, right? It was, she was just telling a story. She was telling the story of for herself and she was telling the story of the company, right? That's a dream pitch. And I've watched pitches from Salesforce dream pitch competition, sustainable brands competition. And the ones that almost always win are the ones that have the best story elements to them. So digging deeper into this, whoops. So first off is the problem. So some people get challenged with this because they're not really sure. It's always, a, it's a question we get out quite often is, well, where do I start? And so the first thing is, we all kind of know the problem we're solving, right? Ultimately, what we, pardon me, what we want to make sure we address is that it's a real problem that actually needs addressing. So how do we do that? And I would say that's, a lot of that is about validation. So. Have you, have you talked to people? Have you actually validated this with anybody? You know, and ultimately describing in a way that people understand and, uh, and avoid over explaining it. Now this can be tough. I'm gonna tell you right now, totally been there as an entrepreneur. This can be tough sometimes because it's like the Seinfeld episode of like, you gotta see the baby. You know, you want, you wanna show everybody how the baby walks, how it talks, you know, all the things about the baby, right? For us, it's important, but we have to remember for the audience, not every little detail is important. It's really about the things that whet their appetite enough that helps them understand what you're doing. And so the problem statement, honestly, I'm gonna tell you guys right now, depending on the length of the pitch, usually shouldn't be more than 30 to 45 seconds, quite honestly. Um, it's usually enough, and you can test this beforehand, right? Easy way to test this is uh, we probably all have people in our network that have no idea what we're doing. My mom still thinks I fix computers. Little, little hint to you guys, I've never fixed computers. So I have no idea where she got that from. But just because I work with technology and apps and software, it's what she thinks I do. So the, the easy thing for me is I can test out on her and family members even. You know, my uncle Don who fixes big rig trucks. He has no idea. He still has a flip phone, right? But if I can explain it to him in a way that he can understand and even kind of explain it back to me, I've probably done a pretty good job at explaining it, right? And if I can do that in 30 to 45 seconds, nailed it. Because at the end of the day, this isn't really, really the big value. If we think about our value proposition, it's not about the problem. It's about the solution and it's about you and how you're going to solve that problem. And what's your plan to execute, right? And how are you going to execute that plan? So it's really getting to the, what I would call, I guess, the meat in the sandwich, or if you're vegetarian, whatever it is, plant-based meat, I guess. Uh, but really like the, the meat of the sandwich. Um, it's really about saving and giving time for that. So that's where you really want to get into the solution, because that's starting to get into the real meat of the sandwich. What is the solution? And again, this is where a lot of people have a challenge because they're not sure about how to talk about the solution. A lot of times they just talk about it like I built an app and it does these things. And maybe they show off a couple of screenshots, right? Um, now in a dream world, of course, if you have a prototype, you can show off the prototype. That's cool. Absolutely. 
Um, I'll give an example though, that the best I've ever seen that, and that fits the narrative storytelling aspect is if you can somehow show from the customer's perspective how the solution works. So for example, if you have a software, what does it look like when they're using it? Even better, I've had some clients where if they already have customers, they actually use the customer as an example. So for example, I have a client where uh, Microsoft was their customer and I worked with them. And one of the things they did is they said, so what we did is we built this software and then we implemented it with Microsoft and this is how they started using it. And then here's the things to remember. When we're talking about value proposition, one of the things that we're really talking about is I always like to think of it as the aha moment. What's that aha moment? Like, aha, you know, we've all had this. We've probably all had products and services in our lives that at some point you have the product and you're like, aha, I get it. I get the value of this. I see why I bought this and I'm glad I bought it. And in fact, I can't really live without it. I'm, I can't believe I lived without it before. I don't, how did I not have this in my life before, right? Even for me recently, getting a new, I'm going to be honest, a good, good example. I never was one that believed in buying an expensive bed. I always paid like 1500 bucks. And then my wife and I went out, bought like a, a more expensive higher end bed. I'll tell you, aha, uh -huh. this is why. Because my sleep has never been better. My back doesn't hurt anymore. So, you know, aha, uh -huh. I get it, right? Another one was uh, we bought one of those iRobot Roombas. And when my wife first got one, I was like, really? Are we that lazy? Like, come on, have we gotten to this point? But then as I'm sitting there on a call a few months ago and it, start, it turned on in its scheduled time and started going around, I was like, oh, that saved me from having to sweep and do all that. I can keep working, right? Ah, oh, uh-huh. I see the value, right? Yeah, I know it sounds silly. You guys are probably like, well, duh, Paul. But you know, sometimes we have these things where anything could be that, right? That aha moment. That's kind of my point is if you can express that in the solution, what does the solution actually look like? How does it work in your customer's hands? How did they use it? What's their aha moment, right? Even from that, like, can you show any testimonials? Can you show any reviews, feedback, right? So we installed it with Microsoft, they're using it. This is how they used it. They love it. Here's a little testimonial about it, right? You don't even have to repeat the testimonial, just have it on the screen. And then this is one of 20 customers we have. If I'm in the audience, I'm gonna be like, wow, this is legit, right? And I actually get how it works. The other bonus is if one of your asks is to get more customers, which hint, hint, it always should be, then guess what the audience can do is go, oh, okay, so if that's their type of customer and that's how they use it, I know people that could use it like that. Maybe I could make some introductions again. People in the audience generally are there because they want to help. They want to be part of the community. So let's give them opportunities to do so, right? It's not transactional. It's about building those connections. It's, it's longer value than that. And that's what I mean by show, don't tell. Um, again, if you can show it, don't just tell it, right? Again, with physical prototypes, if you have that, even better. And I need two seconds because I forgot to plug in my laptop and my laptop is telling me it's going to die. There we go. Okay, so into the opportunity. So the opportunity is really about, like I said, it's about the team. It's about how you make money. What is the business money or uh, sorry, the business model or the money model? Uh, how do you make money? And ultimately, what does that all look like, right? Now, of course, again, it depends on the, on the length of the presentation of the pitch. I wouldn't necessarily always include, you know, your, all your EBITDA and all that stuff. It might be more necessary with a 10, 15 minute pitch for sure. It's all kind of deeper information, but if it's a three minute pitch, you're not going to have time to go through all the EBITDA and blah, 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 but just some light projections. And ultimately, how do you make money? You know, and, and especially if it's like a physical product company, um, we had a, a client we were coaching recently that they've got a, a food-based business 
And um, one of the things right away that we noticed in their pitch was they didn't talk about the cost of goods sold versus how much they retail it for and therefore what's their margin, right? Easiest way to understand the value of a business, okay? So, and they didn't have that in there. Things like unfair advantage. Uh, and then the big one that is a sticking point a lot, we, we, we have a lot of conversations about this, which is traction. And so I'm gonna tell you right now, a lot of people get confused about that word. And if you, if you are on that side, you're not the only one, so don't worry. Most people, when we talk about this, people think of traction as only revenue. So we'll say, like when we hear pitches, we'll say, oh, well, we didn't hear anything about traction. And people will, oh, I don't have any revenue yet, so I don't have any traction. But if we think about this for a second, the definition of traction, let's think about a car driving on the road, the tires actually hitting the road. That is literally traction. And so what I would always equate this to is traction is anything that propels your business forward. This could look like letters of interest, proto, uh, beta customers, early signups, um, signups to an interest list, right? People who are just like on a waiting list, just waiting for you to launch, right? You know, I think it's pretty powerful if you can say, yeah, I haven't launched yet, but I've got 300 people on a waiting list. That's pretty powerful. You know, we had one the other day that uh, was actually about a month ago we were working with and they said this, they said, oh, we don't, we don't have any traction because we're not making revenue yet. And then we dug a little bit deeper and they were like, yeah, we started three months ago. We're going to launch next month. Um, and uh, we've already got 600 people on our waiting list. That's traction. I mean, that's the fact that you've gotten out there and actually talked to people and have something that's going to help you propel your business forward. Traction is anything that helps your business move forward. So uh, make sure to include that information. Because I'd rather, as an investor, for example, I'd rather hear that you've done something instead of sitting around not doing anything, right? Um, I want to know that you've talked to people, that you've actually you know, got some interest, uh, that this isn't just at a standstill and you're just using my money to try to test the market, right? That's not really what I want. And then, you know, at the very least, like I said, with a longer pitch and presentation, a lot of times, yes, you're going to include some deeper financials, projections, all that kind of stuff. But if you don't have that kind of time, the thing I always recommend is the cocktail, what we call the cocktail napkin economics. Um, I don't remember if this year you guys would have met Chris Stairs, maybe during Vancouver Startup Week. Uh, Chris uh, Stairs and Colin McWinney from Canada Startup uh, would have done presentation on... Um, probably money modeling or something like that, the sales primer, I think. But they, Chris talks a lot about the um, cocktail napkin economics, and he's one of our advisors. And really, I just think of it this way as if you were to take a cocktail napkin, actually, I'm glad I'm doing this at the office because we have a client that actually did this. So you take a cocktail napkin and you write the important numbers on there there for your business and what fits is what's important for your business is the simple way of thinking of it, right? There's no one thing that I can tell you, oh, it has to be the same for everybody because it's going to depend on the type of business. Maybe it's if you've got a SaaS subscription platform, right? How many subscriptions over how much time? What's your, your cost of acquisition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Other things, like I said, with a food-based business or a physical product company, you know, what's your cost of goods sold, margin, et cetera, et cetera, right? So what are the numbers that matter to your business that you can fit on a cocktail napkin? That's the ones that should probably be included because that's the ones that are going to matter the most. Anything else is really stuff that people can ask about afterwards. But if they ask, it means they're probably a bit interested. So little kind of investor sales strategy, if you will, for, our, for that side. So ultimately, at the end of the day, investors or really anybody for believability um, on that side, they want to know how is the business going to make not only make money, but how is it sustainable? How is it going to stay in business? And or what's your growth plan? The one thing, um, an old friend of mine, J.S. Parmar, many of you might know the name, uh, former Picatech, sold to Eventbrite. Um, and now his wife and he have started Gunky. I don't know if you've seen that. Um, but, uh, you know, he, he said to me once, and I really appreciated this, which was really, what's your plan? What's the... Uh, What's the plan that you're going to execute and how do you execute the plan? 
And I really appreciated that because it really got me thinking about like, okay, it's not just about the plan, but how are you actually going to make that plan happen? And do you have what you need now to make that happen? And if not, can you at least identify what your gaps are? Because, you know, if we do a SWOT analysis, SWOT's about admitting your weaknesses, but that can, that can be an opportunity to build on those weaknesses and turn them into strengths or fill the gaps and identifying those weaknesses and filling those gaps. So, you know, what is that plan and how do you make it happen? Um, so very quickly, like I was saying, you know, there's some very, very basic ones for your financials, you know, cost of product. I said that one already. Your LTV is a common one that people are looking for, which is your lifetime value. So how long are your customers on average with you? A lot of people question this because they go, well, if I'm a startup, how do I know? The thing is, there's a lot of statistics available about this on industry averages. Um, so even at the beginning, you can kind of rely on that as a gauge, because um, if you're in a certain interest industry, you can kind of go based on that. Um, when are you going to be revenue positive or break even point is a big one. Uh, your burn rate, so how much you're spending on a monthly basis. And then your churn rate, of course, which is how many customers do you lose as compared to how many do you gain, right? Um, so these are some, some uh, uh, numbers that are a lot of times are going to come up in your cocktail napkin economics, for example, that uh, people will really want to hear about, especially depending on the type of business that you are or that you have. All right. Now, into the ask, how am I doing for time? Uh, oh, I'm so good. Okay, good. Um, so into the ask, here's what I want to say to you guys. Everyone, every single person here, if you are building a business, consider yourself an entrepreneur, even if you don't, if you're building a business and you're getting out there and you're pitching uh, or conversing, have con having conversational pitches, even whatever that looks like, if you are out there and you're building a business, everybody here, I challenge you, you all have an ask. Everyone has an ask. Uh, I used to say, if, if you want to be an entrepreneur instead of a entrepreneur, you ask. Everyone has an ask. Because here's the thing. I mean, a credit to my uncle when I was a kid. One of the first things he taught me was, don't be afraid to ask. Because if you don't ask, you don't get. Now, he was just trying to get me to uh, get more dates, but that's, that's a different time. But I also carried that over into building business, right? I thought about it as, okay, well, if you don't ask, you don't get. And you know what the thing that he told me was the worst thing that they're going to say is no. Now I am talking about customers here, right? So the worst thing or investors, the worst thing that they're going to say is no, that's okay, right? It's okay because there's more out there. I guess in dating life, there's a lot of fish in the sea, as they say. But the, the, the flip side of that is that there's always more. And what he taught me as well is even no can mean K-N-O-W, that you need to know more or they need to know more. A lot of it about it is about how you communicate the value proposition, how you, um, how you understand the customer, what the feedback you get, how you, how you translate that. So now this is in the sales workshop, so I'm going to stop on that point. But the point is, is that everyone has an ask. Every single person, if you're building a company, you're building a startup, there's something that you need to help you move forward. And everybody has that thing that's the most important thing to them at that time. So I have a structure. We, we call it M&M, &M, um, not the rapper. I don't think he's relevant at this point, but it's M&M &M as in mentors, network, money. And so I'll start with the mentors part. That's kind of the first step for a lot of early entrepreneurs, early stage entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs in the sense of like young in their career, not necessarily age. But mentors, mentorship, very important. And um, that might be the first thing you're looking for, and which is more of a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship, right? Um, somebody who can just be your guide, be there as an ear to, to listen to you. Um, you know, I have a, a couple mentees and sometimes it's just, they just need to ask me like, hey, here's this thing, blah, blah, blah. Am I crazy? Well, yes, because uh, you're taking this journey, but that's awesome. We all need to be a bit crazy sometimes to, to do cool things, right? So that's okay. 
but just giving a bit of feedback and giving some guidance and perspective, um, knowing that they're not alone, those things can make a big difference. So sometimes mentors uh, can, no, mentors are always a good thing. So that might be the first thing you're looking for. Then the next thing you might look for is network. So network is anything having to do with, could be customers, could be uh, connections to investors, could be potential uh, partners, team members. Maybe you're looking for a developer or you're looking for an engineer or a designer or whatever that might be. Network, network, network. I've built my entire career on networking and I can highly attest that it's about the conversations and the connections. It's about knowing that when I post on LinkedIn and I ask for help, I get uh, a ton of responses, right? Building those, those connections and um, lowering the barriers of trust. And ultimately, uh, then of course, the last one is money. And I do it last because it's sometimes the least important, right? Um, but sometimes, uh, honestly, network for me has been far more valuable than a lot of the checks I've gotten. So yeah, money, if, you're, if you are strictly raising money and that is the thing you're asking for, then absolutely. But here's what I'm gonna say. No matter what you're asked, pick one, maybe two. I like sticking with one, but if you have a couple in there, that's okay. But whatever your ask is, be specific. And what I mean by that is as specific as possible. I'll give you some examples. So if this was an investor event right now and I was pitching and I came in and I said, I'm looking for an advisor. A lot of you would be like, well, I know lots of people. I know lots of people that could be advisors. What kind of advisor? I don't know what kind of advisor. There's lots of types of advisors, tech advisor, business advisor, marketing advisor, sales advisor, growth advisor. I don't know what to do. It's too much work. I'm not going to do it. That's how the human brain usually works, especially for investors. Investors don't like to do work, right? Generally speaking. So that's too much work. I'm not going to do it. And I don't want to risk looking stupid and introducing the, right per the wrong person. So I'm not going to do it for that reason, right? Our pitch is an opportunity. The worst thing in business is to have missed opportunities or lost opportunities. This is an opportunity to make connections for the things you need to progress your business to get traction. So if you're going to ask for an advisor, for example, ask for exactly the type of advisor you need. I'm looking for a business advisor. Even better, I'm looking for a business advisor with 10 years of experience in this field, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, I heard one a great a great one a little while ago. I think at one or two of our pitch events ago, um, where they they had a retail tech solution uh, for e-commerce, um, and it was they, they said specifically it was actually quite refreshing and and awesome. But their ask was, we're looking for a business advisor who has experience in retail and uh, retail e-commerce solutions. Okay, and then now. What happens is I, myself, and a bunch of other people were right away in the chat. Oh, I know somebody, blah, 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 and LinkedIn links, and like a whole bunch of stuff starts happening, right? Awesome. Now the conversation started. You never know what can come from a conversation. That's the beauty of it. Another example, money. So I heard a pitch recently where they finished their pitch, and they said, so to do all of this, we're, we're raising a round. And the round we're raising is between, uh, what did they say? I think it was uh, between 150 and 350,000. So uh, thanks, Miriam. Yeah, exactly my reaction. Which one is it, right? Uh, it's quite a range. So how, you know, what, you know, let me just give you some perspective on that. What that sounds like to an investor and maybe even everyone in the audience is, that sounds to me like you're gonna dig a hole take my money and just kind of push it into the hole and just hope for the best. And what it sounds like to me is you don't have a plan, right? You don't have a specific plan that you're actually gonna follow and know how you're going to use that money. Part of what the money part is about 
and from an investor's perspective, is how are you going to put that money to work? What is it going to achieve? An old friend of mine named Anthony, uh, who is an investor, he always put it a great way. I, I loved how he put it, which was, you know, I don't care how much the check is. I don't, how much I don't care how much money it is. What I care about is how are they going to make the money work and what is it going to achieve? And he said, I was like to think about if the money was an employee or a team that you were hiring and they had a specific job to do, what would be that job description? Kind of think of it that way, right? So if you're raising, you know, be specific. If it's 250K, what is that 250K going to do? Now, I'm just going to tell you for a second, what we hear a lot, and you'll probably hear this a lot if you're out there pitching, uh, we're raising money for sales, marketing, and R&D. That's the de facto easy answer, right? Well, cool, sales, marketing, R&D. Well, yeah, sure, always. But what is it really going to achieve? Is it we're raising this and it's going to get us to break even. It's going to help us double our revenue. It's going to uh, get us to market and increase our market penetration and get us our first revenue. Is it What is it really going to achieve? Right, Because now from the investor's perspective, now they can really wrap their minds around like, okay, so if I put my money in, I really know what's going to be done with it, right? Yeah, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't all know exactly what's going to happen, but at least what I have a sense of is you're de-risking, you're ticking my boxes, and you're showing me you have a plan. Now, from an investor's perspective, we're not stupid. Most of us are no uh, that's not always how the journey goes. Many investors have been through it. So we know that not everything goes according to plan, but at least you have a plan versus the other company that pitches. So you versus them. I hate to put it that way, but a lot of times that is how it is. You versus them. If you say, this is how I'm going to use the money. This is my plan. This is how it's going to work versus the other company that pitches and just says, 250 for sales, marketing, R&D the investor will likely be more into the fact that you told a plan. You're, they're going to show more, um, see that that's more de-risked and see that that's more of a viable opportunity, generally speaking. Paul, there's, there's exceptions couple, to the rule. So, there's yeah. a couple of questions, Paul. Do you want me to save them for the end? or uh, do you want me to... uh, For the end, if that's okay. Yeah, I think I'm almost done and then I'll leave time for a, a few questions. So okay. if, if I can. So, uh, and just to that point, it's like really like considering your milestones, you know, we should in our plan, well, we should have milestones. We should have a kind of a projected timeline of what we want to achieve and when. Uh, so a lot of times the methodology is like, what do you raise enough to get to that next major milestone? And a lot of times that usually ends up being a year to two years out. It's somewhere in there. Okay. Uh, again, Anthony used to say it a really great way, right? If you're going to raise money, raise enough to get a ticket to Toronto, not to Winnipeg, and then have to come back and ask for more money for a ticket to, uh, from Winnipeg to Toronto, right? Um, I always try to think of it that way. Now, uh, yeah, I'm almost finished. So the, the going back to this, so um, I used to have a slide in here uh, where it was a cat putting a newspaper down going, I should build a deck. And so, you know, a lot of questions that I get are, well, what about the deck? How do I build a deck? And so the thing I want to tell all of you is to remember that you, if you're pitching, if you're the one pitching, you are the star of the show, not your deck. Your deck is your supporting actor, okay? You're there to win the awards and the accolades and, and, and win, right? It's you. You're the star of the show and your deck is your supporting actor. You could probably even see from my deck, even I am like, uh, my deck has more words than I usually like. But as you can tell, like, I don't have a lot of words, images, very simple, clean, right? We just did it in Canva. It's not like super fancy. I've had people say to me, oh, do I need to hire a designer to spend and spend two twenty five hundred dollars on designing a beautiful deck? No, you don't need to do that. Just keep it clean, simple as little words as possible, just to support what you're saying, right? So if you're gonna talk about, an example might be like, oh, we have a huge market. Have the slide behind you show the market statistics, right? If you're gonna talk about, yeah, so our plan over the next three years is to 
right, uh, you know, to do this, to do this, you might have a timeline behind you in the slide, right? You don't have to go through every single detail that's on the slides. The thing is, is I can read and I can usually read the slide before you're finished speaking. And that's nothing against you. That's just nature, right? But we also have to remember most humans can't listen and read at the same time. So if the focus is on you and building trust and breaking down barriers, I really need to be listening to you, not reading your deck. And I hate to be harsh, you guys, but if you're going to read the deck out to me, I don't need you there. I, I, I hate to be that harsh. Happens a lot. And if you're just going to read the, the slides to me, uh, yeah, I, you don't need to be there. I can, you can just send it to me. I'll read it on my own. Thanks. So, because that's not the point. I want to get to know you because potentially I'm investing in you or want to be on your team or help you, not necessarily the business of itself. Okay, so just really quickly, some uh, red and green flags, and then we'll get to the questions. So some red flags. I don't know if you've, any of you have heard of this before. We have no competition. I'm sure Angie has heard this many times uh, throughout her years. We have no competition. Oh boy. Wow. Where do I start? So we have to remember there is always competition. It's extremely, extremely rare that a company or a startup is going to be created where there's absolutely no competition. There is always direct or indirect competition. We need to remember that and it is best to recognize it. We've even had people that have said that and we've asked them, why don't you mention it? And they say, well, you know, I'm scared that if I say there's competition, people will think that I don't have a chance. Okay. But I think it's about how you're different, better. People don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it, right? So how are you better, different, easier, right? You know, and the reality is, is there's tons of companies that do the same thing, but people choose which company to do business with for different reasons, right? Even at Volition, there's other companies that do what we do. Usually it's actually because um, we have advisory coaching services. Usually it's because there's individual coaches out there. Absolutely. But people like the fact that we have a team of coaches available and we also do programming and almost all of us are teachers. So they really like that idea as well, because we're good at good and passionate about knowledge sharing. So people like that, but maybe it's not for everybody. Maybe they want a consultant coach. That's just one-on-one -on -one only with them. Totally cool. Right. There's more than enough out there. Don't be afraid to admit it. It's even actually better to show that you've done your homework than not have done your homework. I still remember, I'll give an example. And when we were in Seattle, when we lost in Seattle, a company came up and pitched and they were pitching a daycare on demand service. And they walked up and they said, we have no competition. When literally a company had just raised in Seattle $200 million for exactly the same thing. And Angie and I probably know two companies here in Vancouver that were doing that before. And so I was like, right away, I was like, are you sure you don't have competition? Because I could name three other companies right now in your vicinity, right? We have to remember there's an entire world out there. There's always going to be competition. So don't be afraid to admit it. But how are you better, different, right? Why, why would customers do business with you as opposed to somebody else? No clear path. I'm just going to say simply that that's just not showing that you have a plan. Steamrolling, which is what I mentioned at the top, when people walk in and just a bunch of statistics. I remember a couple of years ago, somebody walked into around our pinch events and they were like, I'm building the best business since Shopify. It's going to be the greatest thing. We're going to do a million dollars in revenue by the end of the year. It's going to be worth $10 million in two years, blah, 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 blah. And he went through all these numbers. Funny thing is he was like, that's best thing since Shopify. And one of the original five of Shopify was on our panel. <laughs> and he was like, ah, uh, I'm not so sure you know what you're saying. And he's like, you don't know what you're talking about. Uncoachability is also a thing that is a red flag. So, um, and then another thing of like not showing any passion. You know, I, I heard a pitch recently where as they were pitching, it was almost like between, um, Every second sentence is like, and what we're also doing is this. And, you know, while we're at it, we're going to get some more customers. And we're going to raise some money. And it was like, are you excited? Would, somebody even said at the end, they're like, are you actually excited about this? 
oh yeah, I'm just tired. And it's like, well, I understand that, but I'm sorry, it's a bit tough, right, to, to get behind you if that's what I'm hearing. So being aware of that and conscious of that um, is, is obviously very important. Green flags. So if it's not clear already, clear differentiation from your competition. Uh-huh, I kind of talked about that. Knowledgeable about your unit economics. So how do you make money? How much do you have to sell to make more? How many do you have to sell to make this, et cetera, et cetera? That's really good. And a quantifiable ask. Um, so especially if this is if you're asking for money, how did you come up with that? At early stages, there's not really a validation on valuation, right? You can't really, you know, if you're doing three thousand dollars a month in revenue, you can't really do a revenue multiple valuation. Doesn't really make sense. Um, you know, there's there's obviously a lot of different methodologies. So how did you come up with the ask? Sometimes the ask, the valuation is what you make it. Um, and as long as it seems realistic and quantifiable, um, then you can probably uh, get it. Or if you have a lead advisor, or, sorry, lead investor that's already, uh, you know, signed the term sheet, for example. So how did you get there? And I always almost say, well, when anything has to do with numbers, quantify it. Where did you get that from? Just a quick view on this is my recommendation is to have three types of decks. One is your short form deck, which is usually for 90 second to two minute pitches, sometimes three minute pitches. A long form pitch deck, which is for your five to 10 minutes. And you can usually stretch that out if you need to, like to a 10 and 15, because you're just adding information. It's easier to add than to take away usually. And then last but not least, your slide deck, which is the one that you send to people. Okay. That's of course going to have more information of it. I always think of it as like your summary of your executive summary um, that you send to people because that's the one they are going to actually read. Now, in summary, pitching is an opportunity to generate intrigue and secure a conversation. So the key is to not be scripted and tell a story. Even Natalie Portman, if you watch her masterclass, on masterclass.com, she talks about that she rarely follows the script and she talks about what, and she tells the story and, and says what she believes the character would say in that moment. Um, she's won awards, so she must have some idea of what she's doing. Um, you know, it's really about telling the story and having that structure and flow helps you to make sure that you're taking the boxes, providing the information that's necessary. But because you're present, because you have a structure and flow, you're storytelling, you're also gaining trust and, and memorability, um, especially in the sense that if you're pitching in a competition amongst a bunch of others, you want to be memorable at the end, right? And then, like I said, if you don't ask, you don't get. So don't be afraid to ask. The worst that they say is no, and that's okay. At least you know. As mentioned, Angie mentioned that we have an event uh, June 30th um, and in August as well, we also have the BC Women's Startup Showcase. So if there's any women in the, in the audience that um, uh, for either of these events, uh, we would love to have you join us. So please do register. Both events are free for pitchers and for audience actually too. So um, yeah, would love to have you there and the uh, link I'll put the link in the chat in a moment. I don't actually have that handy at the moment. Um, and here's my profile. And I will take questions if we have time for it. Yeah, I guess we do. Yeah. We've got a couple minutes. Um, you're welcome to put your hand up if you want or put them in the chat. Um, so first quick question from Arjun. Should I include the preferred terms in my ask? Preferred terms, I'm going to assume what they mean is like uh, common shares. Um, I don't know if they want to clarify, but I'm thinking what they mean is like a, a, we're going to raise and we're selling common shares or preferred shares, things like that. Thinking. And so if I know what they're asking in terms of like, should we provide the terms in the ask? Uh, my students tease me all the time because my answer a lot of times to them is it depends. Um, it depends on the investor. I've had varying answers on this. Uh, I'm going to say eight out of 10 investors that we've asked say no. Um, the reason being is because they really just want to know what the ask is and what it's for. And the terms are a lot of times negotiable. So it depends, number one, it depends on how much you're able and willing to put your foot down. 
like if your terms have already been finalized, like if you have a lead investor that signed the term sheet and you're comfortable with sharing that, fine. You'll see that usually a lot with a lot later stage companies that have like defined valuations, defined terms, and have the ability to put their foot down and say, you know, they've done a series A and they can say like, no, we are worth this much. This is our terms and they have the leverage. But I would say if you are much earlier stage, uh, you usually don't have that. And a lot about the terms are still negotiable. Um, so the tendency is not to include it. Yeah, uh, they did clarify saying, yeah, like a uh, safe or convertible note. So right. I think comments probably apply. I yeah. Mean, uh, say we're, we're raising X amount on a safe, something like that, but. Yeah, I don't even, I, t I, I have a tendency in the companies I work with, we don't even necessarily say what vehicle is going to be used because again, that's sometimes in a conversation with the investor. Um, I don't want to turn at early stages. I don't want to turn anybody away. I want, I want to have conversations, right? Um, and if they're really interested in investing, you'll usually find a way. Okay. Uh, Samuel's asking, should we pitch New Ventures BC in the same way as we would investors? Uh, primarily, do we include the ask slide? So um, uh, I would say, well, why don't you answer and I can add on to whatever you say. <laughs> Angie can correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah. I know what I would do and I would say yes. Yeah, absolutely. Because you never know who's in the audience. And I can tell you at New Ventures, there's some pretty amazing people in those audiences. So you never know who knows who, and you never know what comes from a conversation. So create those conversations. That's what it's all about. Yeah, you can certainly, yeah, I would agree with that comment. Only thing I can add, I think if you are around 2.5, we talk about making sure you mention how, how you'll win. Right. Um, so really kind of emphasizing that part is as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, nothing's wrong with including an ask, um, you know, in, in it. Even if it's, it can be the ask, plus it can also be to advance in the next round, right? Um, and then last one I've got here, Miriam asked this a while ago, but uh, I think uh, so it looks like it's related to IP. How can we secure our idea if we're doing a pitch? Mm, the age old question. If I tell somebody, are they gonna steal the idea? Yeah, you know, you may not like my answer. Um, now, I, there's kind of two sides to this. Obviously, if it's patentable, and you are applying for a patent, that's one thing, right? So you certainly don't wanna give the secret sauce away of the patent um, because that's a no-no. We, uh, I think most of us probably know that. Um, if you don't, there's lots of information about that online or I don't know if New Ventures has an IP. Yeah, that's been, yeah. It's, it's in the video archives now. Ah, great, there you go. So New Ventures has information on that, but I, if, it, if it is regarding that. Now, on the flip side of that, of course, if you have something as patentable, then all I say is you can still pitch it in a general high level sense without giving away the secret sauce. That's one way. Number two, my, my comment has been, here's what I've learned over the last 20 years. It's a lot different than it was when I first started. When I first started, I remember my first tech company, the, the, the owner was like, don't you tear, dare tell anybody, don't you do any like, yeah, right? But it was a lot different back then. Nowadays, I've come to learn that for the most part, when you're out at pitch events, there's people aren't there to steal your idea. They're, to, they're there to try to help in some way, or just they're curious, or maybe they want to be an entrepreneur. And what I found more often than not is really if, here, here's kind of my answer, is if somebody is going to steal the idea at the same time, I mean, I could ask this question to you guys. Are you all busy? Have your own things to do? Right. The, the reality is, is most people have their own things going on, their own life. They're busy. So it's going to take a lot, number one, for them to go, is it, even though it's a great idea for you, I always kind of think of it as wherewithal. Do they have the interest, passion, knowledge, um, capital, time, want, connections, um, capacity to actually make it happen? Like enough that they're going to, ideas are great. Uh, company startups can be great, but is it enough that they're going to drop everything they're doing and do it right? And I always kind of look at it this way: is I've I've heard that before. Even people say like, "I'm going to steal your idea." I say, "Go ahead and try," because honestly, if you beat me to it and you do it better than I do, I probably wasn't going to succeed anyway. Maybe that's not the answer you want to hear, but that's kind of how I think and what I've seen over the last twenty years. 
Yeah, no, I'd agree with that comment. All right, we're out of time. So thank you very much, Paul. Um, if you are in round 2.5, you'll have the opportunity to get some feedback on your pitch from Paul or uh, his partner, um, co-founder at Volition, Melanie Ewan as well. Uh, next week is our final seminar, but just due to some scheduling issues with the speaker, that's a different time. So I think it's at 2.30. So we'll send you a reminder, but just, uh, just keep that in mind. Um, otherwise, thanks again, Paul and Volition. And thanks to everyone for joining us and have a great afternoon. We'll see you soon. Paul, you want to say something? I was just, I, well, I had a question for you. I can, I, I'm, I'll share the slides with you. Yes. Yeah. 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 And then is it, assuming there's nice things, uh, can we, oh, well, I'll talk to you about it afterwards. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's a good reminder. We post the video to our YouTube the following day and the, the it's also on our website. If you go to our blog, uh, everything's the entire series is there so uh and i believe we sent a link to it in our uh, follow-up event right as well with this with the feedback survey so lots of different ways uh all right round two have a great day <laughs> and uh we'll see you soon paul we can stay on here if uh okay. if you like perfect thank all you right. thanks thanks everyone bye all bye megan bye everybody thank you <laughs>